Welcome, men, and uh, justice and mercy. It seems like that so often uh, these things are pitted against one another, and how can God be just and merciful at the same time? Uh, we have, we just talked about in the last panel that the cross demonstrates that. We see justice and mercy coming together and both being uh, fully put on display. But we've been hearing a lot about justice over the last several years, especially in the last year, so much of the um, lawlessness that broke out publicly, violently in our nation these last eight to 10 months or so has been justified in the name of justice. You know, we are seeking justice and no justice, no peace. And because God is just, then Christians ought to be pursuing justice. And we have had uh, arguments, every one of you guys, uh, all, all of us up here have had the arguments put to us, accusations made against us that we really don't care about justice and therefore we really aren't seeking to live before God, for God in the world. That we're content to just let things go unjustly in the world and uh, pretend that we still love the God who is just. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump right in and say, whatever happened to mercy ministry? Right? I mean, y'all remember when you used to have mercy ministry? It's like the justice has taken over. Justice is the thing. And it's interesting to me. We, we have been speaking of what's going on presently as a new religion. There really is a new religion afoot. And that new religion is very serious about justice, not true justice. Right? They're serious about their own form of justice, which is an injustice. But they're very serious about, they're using the words all of the time. But there's no mercy. They're, they don't have a, there's no mercy in what's going on there, which is striking to me, which signals to you something about the idol that's operating at the, at the top, or you could say at the bottom of that system. Um, it's not a, there's not a merciful God. Our God is merciful and he is just. Uh, the God of this age, which we're seeing manifested in these great cries for justice is whatever that idol is, doesn't have mercy. Yeah, I, I think you're right. We, when we examine justice uh, and what's being labeled as justice, um, it shifted. You mentioned the God of, his, of this age. Uh, when, when we were doing a, our, our research on the BLM movement for, from one of our episodes, um, the, the, the beginnings of the movement were on the back of the, the Trayvon Martin case. And what was said in that instance was that justice was not served. And what was meant by justice was not simply that the, the issue had been properly adjudicated, that all of the evidence had been brought to bear, that, that the decision uh, was, was somehow not, not uh, landed upon uh, from a standpoint of proper evidential, uh, an evidential basis or a, or, or, a, or a missing of the judicial process. But the reason that injustice was done in their mind was because the outcome did not correlate with what they thought was, was right. Uh, and as a result, then they believed that injustice was afoot. And as a result, the, a whole movement then began. And again, my, my goal is not to, to dive head deep into, into just that narrow sphere, but, to, but when you mention the God of this age uh, and, and what's, what's, what's going on in culture, uh, what's meant now by justice, uh, it, it has nothing to do with justice. It has to do with sinful partiality, right? It's, an out, it's outcomes based. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with an objective standard by which to examine anything. So. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I've, I've found and the way that I've tried to help people think about this is to show people that the issue is not the question of justice but the question of injustice. I think there's agreement on the idea of, of justice, but there's disagreement on the question of injustice. And in a worldview that sees inequity as injustice, not inequality, right? Um, e e equality says, you know, all of us are sitting on chairs that are the same size, the same manufacturer. That equity says that when we sit up, all of our heads should be at the same height, right? We're not catching up with, yeah. Tom. Not catching up with yeah. Bodie. Yeah, 
That's, that's, that's just a way to illustrate the, the, the difference, right? So that's what equity says. So that's why, for example, to go back to um, Tray Trayvon Martin, which is very interesting because the argument is that the police are hunting and killing black men, um, but the police didn't kill Trayvon Martin um, or Ahmaud Arbery, but their names still get lumped into the, you know, to the, to the whole deal. But, but the idea is uh, disproportionate numbers, right? right? Therefore, the individual facts of the individual case don't matter. They're irrelevant, right? Uh, because justice or injustice is about equity. And this is all rooted and grounded in a particular worldview, a particular way of viewing things and analyzing things, a particular set of assumptions, um, and an oppressor-oppressed paradigm um, that, that then assumes that whatever inequities are being experienced by a quote-unquote oppressed minority has to be a direct result of the injustice of the oppressive majority. And so that's why it often seems like you're having two different conversations, right? Because when you're talking about justice, well, justice would say, just, to, just like you said, right? This needs to be adjudicated. The facts need to come out. The fact, you know, that's what, no, 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 no. You only think that, they would say, because you don't understand what the injustice is. If you understood that the injustice was the disproportionate, you see what I'm saying? Right, right. Then you'd understand we're having a completely different conversation right. and none of that stuff matters. Right. And so part of the problem is that we haven't understood that we're dealing with a particular worldview with a particular set of presuppositions and that because of that, we're often having two different discussions. Yeah, and it becomes a real difficulty when Christians try to enter into that discussion and they begin to acquiesce to the presuppositions that are largely unstated. And once you do that, game is over. Yeah, Tom, you're exactly right. Matter of fact, uh, Virgil and Vody have both touched on something that I think is very important to this conversation. Uh, Tom, to your point first though, Virgil and I often reiterate, and we're very dogmatic on, our, on the Just Thinking podcast, that you run the danger as Christians to, when you, when you adopt and when you embrace the, the language and the vernacular of the world, you end up fighting that battle using the world's terms on the world's turf. And you will lose that battle every time. Every time. You must be rigid, fixed, and dogmatic to use biblical language, biblical vernacular, and flip that question, that worldly secular question, flip it and interpret it into biblical terms and then pose the question back at them. Now, both Virgil and Vody have mentioned the words, the facts, facts of the case. They're both absolutely right. The justice that is primarily talked about in the world today is an outcomes-based construct, okay? If the outcome of a situation or circumstance is is, 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 is uh, manifests itself as to uh, what I desired the outcome to be, then that's justice. But if the outcome is other than I would desired it to be, that's injustice. So it's outcomes based. And I wanna challenge you this, scripture gives us an amazing example of what Vody, the distinction that Vody was just making here, which is crucial. The distinction between equality and equity. When you have a moment, go back to 1 Kings chapter three, and study the uh, adjudicated situation that King Solomon was involved with, with the two prostitutes who came to him, each one of them claiming that the baby was theirs. Here you have, talking about the facts of the case, this is equity, biblical equity in action. Solomon tried to drive to ascertain what is the truth. So first and foremost, justice is based on objective truth. Objective truth. Ultimately, in that chapter, each woman had an opportunity to state her case. Obviously, one was lying, one was telling the truth, and in order for Solomon to get to the crux of the matter, as, which, which is, which of you is telling the truth, he threatened to cut the baby in half. He asked one of his servants, 
give me a sword. The woman whose baby it truly was reacted, right? They both reacted. One woman said, yeah, go ahead and cut the baby in half. Now cutting the baby in half, that's equality. That's equality. Each of you get half of a dead baby, but you each have the same volume of dead baby, so that's equality. Equity is getting to the truth despite the outcome. Now Solomon, adjudicating the situation with equity in mind, with truth in mind, he obviously ended up making the correct decision. The outcome, however, is that one of them went home without a baby. The truth was gotten at. Equity was employed, but equality was not. You still get justice. There was no injustice. There was still justice, but justice doesn't mean that each person involved, each party involved is gonna get the outcome that they deserve. So in God's uh, economy, truth is what undergirds justice. What is the truth? regardless of outcome. Yeah, and, and the question of mercy, I mean, your question, whatever happened to mercy ministries? Uh, we don't like to talk or hear much about mercy anymore. It's, it's what we deserve. And whenever you're talking about mercy, if you receive mercy, you're admitting something. I don't deserve this. Right. And I think it's, it's helpful uh, to remind people regularly that we live and breathe by God's grace and mercy. I mean, I will periodically or more than periodically say when somebody says, how are you doing? I said, I'm, and I'm doing fine. I'm not in hell. You're right. If, if we got justice, we'd be having this panel discussion in hell because we all sin and that's what we deserve. If we can get people thinking about that again, uh, that, that could be helpful in this conversation. But again, it is offensive for folks to admit, I don't deserve this kindness, goodness, benefit that is being bestowed to me. Yeah. I don't deserve to have my heart beat. Yeah, well, I think what we're seeing in, in, in culture today, and it's being drawn into uh, even what we're experiencing in, inside the, the four walls of the church uh, is a lost thought process about that particular issue. No one's thinking about that. It's all about me and my rights and what I deserve and, and, and how, how, I've, how historically speaking, my, my ethnic group and, and in, in this instance, they're going to say that a particular race has been wronged. And as a result of the wrong that's been done, I now deserve equity. I now deserve something from someone else so that I can experience equity. And, and I think that's the, that's the real challenge, especially when we see it happening in the culture. And to the degree that no one is willing to, is willing to challenge that, no one is willing to, to, to push back against that, I think that's where we end up finding the biggest uh, source of the problems. How do you deal with this pastorally? I mean, how do you get people to think rightly about these things? I like to read them the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And when I say read them, I mean like read my own heart, that text first, because it's a, especially with all the justice talk, we just get operating in that so often. We think that the world's really just about justice, justice all the time, like law and order. I think I said this in a sermon recently at Grace. Um, you know, we do need law and order. We certainly need law and order. But if all you get is law and order, you, we all go to hell. So you're not going, you're not going to be with Jesus forever if, if all we get is law and order. And so the Pharisee and the tax collector, of course, you have the Pharisee who, who is thanking God that um, he's giving God all the praise and all the glory for not being like these other people. And so, he, you know, you can sympathize with him because you're thinking, well, you know, at least he's not there pounding his own chest saying, I did it. He's saying, I thank God. God, I give you the praise. I'm not like this. I'm not like this. And then that tax collector that was just beating his chest and saying, mercy me, a sinner. And the tax collector is the one who went home justified. And we just need that truth. Vody, last night, brother, I think it was last night, when you did this line, I told somebody, cut me to the quick about how dare we think that God respond to us when we jerk his chain? I was like, wow, how we can drift into that way of thinking. Like, you know, I deserve, you know, I'm, I'm, the, 
And the righteous man, you read the Psalms, and the problem is you forget that these Psalms are ultimately about Christ. He's the one who remembered the law of the Lord. He's the one who meditated on it day and night. He's the one who didn't stand in the seat of sinners and sit in the seat of scoffers. And his delight was in the law of the Lord. It is Christ, 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 Christ. And you know, we don't, we don't get any platform based on what we have done. It really is mercy. We need to remember that. You know, Jared, you know, you think about the law, uh, I think as Christians, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a harmoniology that goes along with why the law in principle, why even the principle of law exists. But as the law exists in our 21st century society today, think about this, laws exist to protect sinners from other sinners. That's fundamentally why laws exist. Now, the, the, where, where mercy comes in, and Tom, I wanna to go back to your question earlier when you talked about whatever happened to Mercy Ministries. I'll tell you what happened to Mercy Ministries. I'm thinking about a quote from Thomas Sowell's book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, where Sowell said, envy used to be one of the seven deadly sins until it was repackaged under its new name, social justice. <laughs> so, so what's happened with Mercy Ministries is that the church has, the church has embraced social justice. Mm under the guise of mercy. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is, you, in embracing that ideology, that ideology has, pre, has replaced the biblical doctrine of mercy. So now everything's a justice issue. Everything is a justice issue. Everything that the church has done for 2,000 years, just in obedience, as, an act, as, a, as a matter of obedience, and obeying God's commands, is now a justice issue. So to get that back, Tom, the church has to, again, be courageous enough to reject the language and ideology of social justice and recapture the biblical doctrine of mercy. John the Baptist said, right, we are to do works in keeping with repentance. We're not to just do works. We're to do works in keeping with repentance. That is what distinguishes biblical acts of mercy from simply worldly acts of social justice. Yeah. So where would you start in this uh, conversation that continues on still today and probably will uh, into the next several years at least in the church with um, we've got to, we got to do justice. We've got to be sensitive to these who are telling us that they have been treated unjustly. When they're operating off of this worldview that you articulated, Vody and their metrics of justice are not the same as what the Bible says. How do you, how do you begin to engage yeah. that in a redemptive way? I think we start with that Second Corinthians 10, you know, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Weapons of our, our warfare, they're, they're, they're not carnal, but they're mighty, mm. right? They're tearing down strongholds. So what do we do? Um, we, we destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. And I think that's one thing that we have to get back to, right? Number one, we destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. So ideologies like, you know, critical theory, critical race theory, intersectionality, and you know, so on and so forth. These are arguments. <laughs> these are ideologies. These are opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God. They present an alternative worldview, a competing worldview, and they need to be destroyed in, you know, in the marketplace of ideas. They need to be obliterated in the marketplace of ideas. We need to expose them for what they are mm -hmm. and deal with them rightly as they are. But then there's a second piece. We, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And you know we've talked around this a, a lot, and Founders has talked about this, and you guys have talked about this on the Sword and Trial a lot. One of the problems is we have this sort of bifurcated view of reality. Like my spiritual life exists over here, and the rest of my life exists over there, and, and, and never the two shall meet. God has something to say about this stuff over here, but, but, but not necessarily this stuff over there. And we're not taking every thought captive. So we don't think about our politics, our education, um, our, our 
science, mathematics, our healthcare, our all of those things. We, we, we don't have a well-orbed, uh, fully informed and developed biblical understanding of these things. So not only are we no longer confessional, right? But we're, we're, all, we're also no longer applicational in that we just think that Christianity is for a certain sphere of life mm -hmm. and not every sphere of life. So there are thoughts that we haven't taken captive. And that weakens us and puts us in the position to be you know, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, which is what we're seeing right now. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I want to I add to that a couple of things from what, what Vody said. And, and part of it is, is what I would see as next steps for, for us in the church, practical steps to, to addressing these kinds of issues. It was, it was more than a decade ago, Vody, you had coined the term ethnic Gnosticism. And I mean, the first time a lot of us heard it, the, the, a lot of us understood what that was. We knew what that meant. We knew what you meant by that. Okay, this, this, is, a, this is a black thing you wouldn't understand type thing. That, was the, that would be the language we would use mm -hmm. in the vernacular in, in, our, in, in cultural settings. And so we, we've gone from that to, to, to experiencing in culture an ethnic antinomianism, right? This idea that, that from, from a standpoint of, of if, if, I've, if I have the right ethnicity, the law really doesn't apply to me. And I'm going to now be able to tell you how to adjudicate issues, situations, circumstances in the culture uh, that in my mind are just, right? So, so you, you've had ethnic Gnosticism. We get this thing. And, and now ethnic antinomianism. Hey, the law doesn't apply to me. I'm, I'm going to rewrite the laws in the way that I see them so that, they can, so, so that now there can become equity Right? And, then, and then from there, what's happening now with, with, with ministries like Founders and others, Vody, the work that you've done, the stuff that we've done on the podcast is we're seeing people get educated about these issues. But we still have the ethnic Gnosticism that's taking place. In other words, what's happening is people are still nervous about the knowledge that they now have. So rather than say anything about it, they'll say it in quiet circles or they'll come up to you or I or one of us and say, hey, everything you've been saying, brother, that's exactly what I was thinking. And while that is incredibly humbling, it's part of the step. The next step has to be, I am now willing to stand on my own two feet and declare what thus saith the Lord from the scriptures because I don't, I don't adhere to any of that stuff. And and let me go back here. You know, you, that, that, that term ethnic Gnosticism, when I was trying to communicate, and I'm glad people have, have, have grasped that term, but it, the term is something I coined, but not the idea, right? right? I, I coined that term in order to explain one of the core tenets of critical race theory. Um, this is from Terry Yasso. Um, this is one of the most quoted um, academic sources on critical race theory. And I, and I think this is very important. Critical race theory is not something that we just started talking about. It's not, a, it's not a concept that we made up. We're not building a straw man. There is a well-developed academic literature on what critical race theory is and what critical race theory does, right? And so Yasso's articles have been cited in academic journals and academic literature thousands of times, right? You get hundreds of citations as a scholar and you winning, okay? Right, you write, a, you write an academic paper and you get hundreds of citations, you're winning, right? Yasso's got thousands of citations. So, so this is authoritative, this is not me. This is leading voice of CRT telling you what CRT believes on this issue on the issue of the centrality of experiential knowledge. That's Yasso's heading, not mine. CRT recognizes that the experiential knowledge of people of color is legitimate, appropriate, and critical to understanding, analyzing, and teaching about racial subordination. Have you noticed that when we start talking about race, people are always talking about having a conversation about race? Not a Bible study, but a conversation. You, you, you bring up CRT and people say you're trying to shut down the conversation about race. And in the conversation about race, what must we do? We must elevate black voices, 
not black thinkers, not black exegetes, not black, black voices and black experiences. We need to sit and listen to the experiences of black voices because the way you come to truth, again, what Yas was talking about is the superiority of experiential knowledge. You don't come to the true knowledge of ethnicity and race through Bible study. You come to it through ethnic Gnosticism, through elevating black voices and through acknowledging the fact that those voices and their experience, their, their experiences are the arbiter of truth and not God. Here's another point that's incredibly important. When you start talking about critical theory, critical theory operates on this, this idea, there's, a, there's a, probably the most influential Marxist after Marx is a guy whose name most people don't know. His name is Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci was an Italian Marxist in the late 1920s, early 1930s, and a prolific writer, even though he was imprisoned by the fascists in Italy. And his contribution is the idea of hegemony. And think about hegemony as um, the worldview um, that oppressor groups use in order to oppress people. Because they're trying to figure out, you know, the, the workers of the world unite, you know, there's supposed to be a revolution. We have the Bolshevik revolution. Why haven't we seen revolutions in other places? For example, why in England? They thought England was rife for a Marxist revolution, but it didn't happen. So why didn't it happen? Well, Gramsci's idea was because of the hegemony, because of the worldview that, that the proletariat have been forced to buy into, right? And this, this hegemony is just something that's not objectively true. It's established by people in power in order to hold on to their power. And that's critical. It's not objectively true. Because another thing critical race theory rejects is the idea of objective truth, scientific knowledge, right? So follow the steps here, because you said from ethnic Gnosticism to ethnic antinomianism. Why is it that we can move to ethnic antinomianism? Because the rules come from the oppressor in order to, hold on to, power. to keep the oppressor's power. Therefore, your rules don't matter when it comes to deciding what is true and what is right, which is why, and I'll, I'll stop here. I, we, we won't do, not doing a lecture on CRT here, but, but which is why they not only talk about white privilege and male privilege and cisgendered privilege, heterosexual privilege, so on and so forth, but also Christian privilege. One of the most significant books being used to teach you know, people in education is um, readings for, uh, oh, I just lost it for something in social justice. Anyway, incredibly popular academic textbook that's being used in schools all around the country in order to educate teachers. And they talk about Christian privilege because Christianity is the ultimate tool that is used by the oppressor to establish their hegemony. Marx, religion is the opiate of the masses. What does an opiate do? Right? It dulls the senses. The masses are not rising up and overthrowing because they've been dulled by religion. Gramsci, sociology is that religion, or I'm sorry, socialism is that religion that must supplant Christianity. He understood it. And all the way down to today, religion and Christianity and Christian privilege, right? Check your privilege, white person, check your privileged male person, check your privileged Christian is part of the same worldview. We do not come out of this unscathed. This is a war against the Christian worldview. And because of that, that's why you move from ethnic Gnosticism to ethnic antinomianism, because the only reason we have these rules in place is because the oppressor put them there in order to oppress everyone else. Okay, I'll stop. You know, it's boys. You talk about that, Vody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's striking how once you start to see what's happening. Readings for diversity and social justice. Okay, sorry. That was the title. Readings for diversity and social justice. Sorry. Always hey, man. comes back. It's like hey, a boomerang. Man, it comes and, back. You know, over 50, man, when it comes, you <laughs> take advantage of it, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Amen. You believe that. You believe that. Um, and as you, as you, as you, 
spell it out. And we've been dealing with this for a while. You know, you've got um, sermons online on ethnic Gnosticism, racial reconciliation, two chapters in by what standard. Um, and so I was just talking to another brother uh, over lunch yesterday um, along a different line of intersectionality, along the line of the um, um, male-female relationships. And he was remarking, it's a scholar, it's a lady scholar, and she's just, you can see, she's got an ax to grind. She's, she's, she's angry that she hasn't gotten what she thinks she deserves, and she's going, you know, at PhD level against, against these people. And it's so strange to watch it and to see it from the Christian perspective. It's like what we're seeing in this new religion uh, along all lines of intersectionality is something that we are all as Christians thoroughly acquainted with. It's called, I, you know, I, I want what I want. I mean, as you're displaying it, I'm like, yeah, I know what it was like to look at my parents and think, yeah, your authority is not real and your rules are not real and I want what I want and you're just in my way and you're trying to do this because you want power over me. It's like, I don't know what that is. Okay, now like, let's put the race thing over it. That works. Put the sex thing over it. That works. Put the male, female thing over it. That works. It's just this, you know, different lenses on the exact same sin and it's not knowing the God of justice and mercy. And, and I would like to take our, our Christian responsibility here. As you mentioned, the bi bifurcated uh, worldview, sacred secular, there's also a bifurcated issue of justice and mercy. You know, you kind of have the justice Christians and the mercy Christians. And the mercy ministry people are out there just trying to give cups of cold water in Jesus' name and care for the poor. And then the justice Christians are wanting to bring down, they've got a new law, and I'm not even meaning Christians, I'm meaning those who are really going wayward. And then we all, play in both of those. We're supposed to bring both of these things, justice and mercy. It's the God of justice and mercy. And we really do have to own how we've, we've, if we don't proclaim God's law and gospel, if we don't proclaim God's justice and mercy, people will create their own. And so this no neutrality idea, we, we have to go and say, this is where the courage comes. I, I, I've noticed there's, there's these men, once you see that, you'll speak. Like, I just, you don't do, like, there, no, it's just hard for everybody. Like, so as a white guy, you don't go and say something. You're like, I know what I'm gonna be called. Well, as a black man, you don't go say something. You know, know what they're gonna be called. Like, everybody's gonna be called something. And then you just realize, like, oh, I love Jesus, and I see what's happening, and I love you too much. No, and, you know, we need that kind of courage. Yeah, I would say uh, that I agree with you 100% there, Jared. Uh, we all need to be courageous. Uh, you know, when you look in Revelation chapter 21, I think it's verse 11, uh, there's a list of behavioral characteristics uh, which are announced by God as being uh, uh, worthy of being cast into the lake of fire. I think a list of about five or six behavioral characteristics uh, by which God is damning them to the lake of fire. Do you know what the first characteristic is? Cowards. Cowards is listed first. Um, so when you think about it, you know, I, I asked a question uh, to your congregation last night, uh, Tom, you know, what are you prepared to lose in this battle? Vody's absolutely right, this is a war. Um, critical race theory, uh, is, 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 is merciless in what it is endeavoring to accomplish. And what you're gonna find, uh, what I appreciate about what, what Vody just did in citing these uh, academicians is what you're gonna find is the vast majority of the material that's available on CRT right now is written by academicians, for academicians. Why? Because the educational institutions are the pipeline for this worldview. And I'm not just talking about at the postgraduate level. I'm not talking about just the Ivy League schools. CRT is coming to your public elementary school kindergarten. It's there now. Yeah, it's already there. It's, it's, it's there now. One of the key tenets of CRT is a, a concept called uh, interest convergence, the interest convergence principle the interest convergence principle. What the interest convergence principle teaches, and I say this with all due respect, this is for the white people in the audience. <laughs> the interest convergence principle is targeted at white people. And what the interest convergence principle means is that white people will only begin to care about black oppression, black justice, 
black equality in so much as those interests converge with their interests. So one academician writes in the, in the book, um, Critical Race Theory in Education, he gives an example of the Emancipation Proclamation. He argues that the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't done on moral grounds, but that Lincoln only issued that emancipation in so much that he realized that the image of the uh, United States on the world stage was being negatively interpreted because of uh, uh, messages that were getting back, back to other countries around the world about how America treats black people. That that was the motive for the Emancipation Proclamation. Not that slavery was wrong in an Imago Dei context. That's one example of how the interest convergence uh, principle works. Now, I say all that to say this. When Vody talks about us destroying arguments, you're not gonna destroy these arguments uh, ex nihilo, okay? It's, this is not something that's gonna be accomplished by you pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Because there is no rabbit and there is no hat, okay? You are gonna have to read what these academicians are writing and educate and inform yourself about what they believe and become even more familiar with what they believe than you are right now. You have to become so familiar with what they're saying that you are so adroit with the Word of God that you can take what they're saying in these books and filter that and interpret that through the Word of God so that you can offer an apologetic that destroys these arguments. Because these arguments, listen, these arguments are so well formed. Listen, the very word equality it, it just, just sort of has a certain ring to it. Or like the, uh, Dr. Uh, Dozal was talking about earlier, it just emits some sort of feeling from us that we just automatically gravitate towards something like that. But the academicians who are pushing CRT, they know that. So when Tom talks about courage, we have to have the courage as believers to reject that and put those words like equity and equality and justice into a biblical and objective biblical context and stick to it and do not waver. Do not waver from it. So because of, yeah, because of convergence theory, because of this idea, and by the way, the reason that this, this this interest convergence is necessary is because white people are inherently evil and are incapable of righteous actions in the area of race, according to CRT. Because um, the first principle is that racism is normal, right? It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, as Robin D'Angelo says, in, in a situation, you don't have to ask whether racism manifested itself in that situation, but how, okay? Because every, every, everything is racist, like, like everything. And so since that's the case, um, you have to do the work of anti-racism. By the way, the work of anti-racism is never done. It's not repentance, it's penance. And it's penance that doesn't end. But there's another thing because of interest convergence. Uh, one of the leading voices in CRT today is Ibram X. Kendi. Um, his book, is How to Be an Anti-Racist, is a runaway bestseller. Um, he, you, you, you can't get him for your organization or institution because he's booked up too far in advance and it costs $20,000 an hour to have him come and beat you about the head and neck on issues of, of race. Um, and so here's what, what he, here's what he proposes. Here's what Kendi proposes. Again, this is one of, one of the leading voices of CRT in our day. To fix the original sin of racism, don't think for a minute that this is not religious, to fix the original sin of racism, Americans should pass an anti-racist amendment to the Constitution that enshrines two anti-racist principles. The first one, racial inequity is evidence of racist policy. And the second one is, the different racial groups are equals. The amendment would make unconstitutional racial inequity over a certain threshold, as well as racist ideas by public officials, with racist ideas and public officials clearly defined. 
It would establish and permanently fund the Department of Anti-Racism, comprised of formally trained experts on racism and no political appointees. Guess who's gonna train them? The DOA would be responsible for pre-clearing all local, state, and federal public policies to ensure they won't yield racial inequity. Monitor those policies, investigate private racist policies when racial inequity surfaces, and monitor public officials for expressions of racist ideas. The DOA would be empowered with disciplinary tools to wield over and against policymakers and public officials who do not voluntarily change their racist policy and ideas. Wow. This is CRT. This is the guy who authored the book that some churches are using, the book How to Be an Anti-Racist. And the answer is not come to Jesus. The answer is works righteousness yes. based on a worldview that is antithetical to biblical Christianity. Yes. This stuff needs to be hammered, not negotiated with. Amen. You know, amen. As we've argued, as we've been saying today already again, we're talking about a new religion. Yes. It has its own epistemology. Yes. My lived experience, yes. not, not the Bible, has its own teleology where it's going. It's utopian. And so until everything is completely equal in every regard, then we have not yet attained the justice that we deserve. And it is completely unbiblical. And so the antidote, it's, I don't mean to be simplistic, but we have got to teach God's people God's word. We got to start with Genesis 1-1. This is God's world. He rules it. We're in it. We're his creatures, and we are accountable to him. And, Jared, as you said, to preach God's law and God's gospel. I think if there was one thing that I could do for evangelical churches, if, if God were to give me a magic wand that this Sunday something would be, anything I wanted to be done in evangelical churches would be done, it would be to get every one of them to begin to preach the Ten Commandments. I think we do just that much that we would begin to rebuild foundations we've lost that make the gospel um, apparent for what it is. The gospel doesn't make sense apart from God's law. The substructure of what happened on Calvary is God's commandments, and we've lost that. We need to recover it, and without that, we're not gonna have justice, nor are we going to have mercy. We need the law desperately, especially when there are some twisted new religions coming in, as has been displayed with CRT and intersectionality. And, and I wanna put in this, because it, it takes a little while to get your mind around some of this stuff. You know, you read some of this stuff, interest convergence, I remember seeing that, and if, you're, if you don't have God's law, what can happen, so beware of this, ditch on each, each side of the road. I remember hearing interest convergence. You know, white people only help black people with the advancement when it benefits them, you know? And um, well, the danger is, you go, that never happens. That never happens. And then I was like, oh, oh, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. So let's be careful for a minute. <laughs> I read that and I was like, Oh, so people using people, that what you're talking about? No, okay, so that's not what interest convergence teaches, but that's the kernel of truth it's taken and it's twisted. So the danger is you see the twist and then you go, you know, white people have never used black people ever. I don't think any white person. And you need to go, hold on, let's think clearly for a minute. This is a fallen world, this is a corrupt world. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, you, people use people. People use people and it's wrong. And so the law will keep you straight on that and you'll be able to look at like interest convergence or something like that and, and, and dissect it rightly. And because, yeah, the charge will come that you, you, you do fall in the ditch on the other side of the road. So the problem, and, and Vody went there as he further explained, you heard him further explain what the, he said, well, the problem is because white people as a whole are, you know, whatever. And that's the problem. It's this total categorization of people by their skin color. That's where the error is. And the law is gonna help us keep, keep that straight when it comes to the way these new religions come in. We're gonna be the ones who are really after justice, who are really after mercy. Amen. Gonna give you the last word here, yeah, Daryl. Yeah, just real quick, Tom. You know, I think it needs to be said, especially uh, in conjunction with what Vody just read, uh, we need to be reminded that um, an administration, a presidential administration was just elected and inaugurated that fully embraces CRT. 
So what you're about to see is CRT codified into law. What you're about to see is this ideology now become law to where faith-based institutions and organizations like Founders and this very church in which we're having this conference is going to be beholden to enforce CRT standards and metrics and policies or face the threat of being shut down. That administration was just elected and inaugurated into office. Okay? Now, I'll close with this, Tom. Virgil mentioned earlier uh, uh, two episodes we did on the Just Thinking podcast. We dedicated six hours of content to exposing Black Lives Matter. Over t across two episodes, six hours of content we gave you on Black Lives Matter. And, and one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the statistics and, and, and one of the tools of CRTers and social justicians is to use ethnic-centered statistics uh, as a means to uh, uh, v validate their argument. So for example, someone will say, well, black people make up only 13% of the American population and yet they make up 40% of the prison population. Well, you know where else the numbers 13 and 40 apply? 13% of Americans are black, but they make up 40% of the abortions. Same 13%. But what you hear is that the prison uh, population is unjust, unjust, because 40% of the prison population consists of black men. You'll never hear labeled an injustice that that same 13% represents 40% of abortions in America. You will never hear that. So my encouragement to you today is to do the work of preparing yourself to destroy these arguments. It takes work. You're gonna have to work at this. You're gonna have to work at getting in the word, knowing what the word says, and I would just add to Tom's admonishment to teach the word of God, to teach your people to believe it. Because if you don't believe what you're being taught, it's a moot point. Tom, I'll give it back to you. Adam. Amen. Well, brothers, thank you so much for uh, coming up here addressing this topic. Let's close together by prayer. Our Father, we bow to you because you are the God of justice and mercy. You are the one who has revealed to us Jesus Christ. You've given him to us, and in him we have been reconciled to you. In him we have found sin forgiven. In him we have been given an everlasting life. And I pray that your spirit would work in us more deeply, taking your word and causing us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ so that we might live joyfully and hopefully in this wicked and perverse generation. Help us to shine as stars. Help us to set our hope upon you, the, the God who always does what is right, and to live wholeheartedly for you from this time forward forever. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.